with me again to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, chapter number two again. Commencing it with verse number eight through verse number 11. And in the early worship, I talked about the rich little poor church. In this worship, I want to talk about the poor little rich church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through verse number 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The poor little rich church. Smyrna, the city of Smyrna, is 40 miles from the city of Ephesus. Ephesus, the first church that Jesus writes a letter to, is the church that has two letters written by two different apostles. The apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesus, this letter to the church of Ephesians. And then John writes this letter dictated by Jesus to this fallen church. Ephesus is the fallen church, while Smyrna is the fearful church. The church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia are the only two churches of the seven churches at Asia Minor that Jesus does not criticize. Every other church, Jesus has something against them, except for the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia. This city of Smyrna is a free city. It is a carefully planned city. It is a seaport town like Ephesus and Corinth. There are temples. It's a religious city. There are temples to the Greek god Zeus, to Aphrodite and Apollos, to the god of medicine Asclepius. You've seen this staff with these intertwined snakes on that staff. That's a symbol of the god of medicine Asclepius. There's a temple to Asclepius there in Smyrna. Smyrna also have a, has a street there that is paved with pure gold. It runs from the temple of Zeus all the way to the temple of the goddess Diana in Ephesus. But the Jewish community or this little community of faith in this city is suffering persecution. They will not bow. They will not give obedience to Caesar. And because they will not bow to Caesar, they are being ostracized from the trade guilds or the trade unions in Smyrna, and so economically they are suffering hardship. The city is rich, but these Christian inhabitants are poor. 
they have absolutely nothing. They are destitute because they refuse to worship idol gods. Uh, because they would not do emperor worship. Uh, because they would not bow the knee to Caesar, they have been pushed out of Smyrna's economy and they are suffering brutal persecution. Marcus Aurelius is the emperor at, at Rome now. And this city, Smyrna, is a rich city. But the Christians there are suffering economic hardship. And although they are poor materially, they are rich spiritually. Uh, their real treasure is not in Smyrna. I wish I had one or two more Bible readers. Uh, Jesus, who is the Christ, who was rich, for our sake he became poor, that we might inherit his riches. And so although we may not be materially prosperous, if you have spiritual wealth, it is far greater than material wealth. Because you do understand that if your self-worth is determined by your net worth, you are a miserable creature. Come on, help me preach if you can. If all that you have can be put in a closet, can be driven on the highway, can be stored in a freezer or a pantry, if all that you have, you're walking in, wearing, spending, if everything that makes you, you, is material, you are a sad individual. Build your hopes on things eternal. Our treasure is not here on earth. Because on earth, moths can corrupt it. Rust can corrode it. Thieves can break through and steal it. But if your treasure is in heaven, moths can corrupt it. Rust can't corrode it. Thieves cannot break through and steal it because your citizenship is in heaven. Walk with me around the table and look at this church's comfort. Although they were materially destitute, they were poor and suffering economically, Christ gives them a word of comfort. In verse 8, the angel of the church at Smyrna, he writes, These things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Their comfort, our comfort, is in the person of of Jesus Christ. He is a divine sovereign over history who alone possesses the attributes of eternity. He says, I am the first and the last. In the Greek, that would be Alpha and Omega. Come on, you can help me preach it. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He that liveth and was dead but is alive forevermore. He is our comfort. And then they are comforted in the perception of Christ. Not only is he the first and the last, not only does he possess eternality in his attributes, but he knows what we are up against. Brothers and sisters, this ought to comfort the believer this morning. That there is no sob, no tear, no heartache, no pain, no fear that the Lord Jesus does not know about. Uh, he has faced life to the full. He's drunk its sorrows to the dregs. He knows what you're going through. There's no tear that comes in your eyes that take him by surprise. He cries when you cry. 
He suffers when you suffer. He's there with you in your midnight hour. He upholds you when life is falling apart all around you. Don't be discouraged this morning. Don't, don't be distressed today. He knows what you're up against. And he will not leave you in it by yourself. Oh, brothers and sisters. I need somebody to help me testify here. That uh, when we were in high school, class of 1987, uh, you would write in your classmates' yearbooks. Uh, if it was a girlfriend or a boyfriend, we'd write and sign their, their, their yearbook, yours forever. And you went to your 10th year class reunion and said, what happened to you? Come on, talk back to me if you can. Uh, 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 you, you, you thought that they were yours forever. Or you thought that they would be in your life forever. But understand that God sends people in your life only for a season. Uh, because everybody is not going to be with you to the end. Oh, yes, they say they will. They say they'll stand with you. But when the going gets tough, they'll leave you by yourself. But I know a friend who will stick with you closer than a brother. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He knows your pressure. The word here. Where it says, I know your works and your tribulation. That word tribulation comes from the Greek word or the Latin word tribulum, which is a stone that is used to grind in a mill to separate the wheat from the chaff. It's a stone that is used to press and to pressure the wheat to remove the chaff. That's what David had in mind when he wrote Psalm number one. I need one or two Bible readers here. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Come on, you can help me say it. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate both day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Come on, you can help me say it. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. When pressure comes, it separates the believer from the non-believer. When, when pressure comes, it, it, it separates the wheat from the chaff. Anybody can praise God with a freezer full of food. Anybody can bless God with a job in the morning. But when life turns on you, when sickness comes, when the bottom falls out, when death comes, can you still come to church and say hallelujah anyhow? Um, in, in, in Smyrna, 
there was a tree that produced a plant called the myrrh plant. Now you, you've heard of myrrh. Uh, when the wise men came to visit Jesus in the manger, they brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Myrrh comes from this tree, from this plant. Uh, it's a gum tree. And myrrh was used as an embalming spice because it had a sweet aroma. It had a fragrant odor. But the only way to get the sweet fragrance was to crush the leaves. Somebody missed that. The only way to make it smell sweet was to crush it. The only way God can get a sweet praise out of you, he's got to crush you. He's got to pressure you. He's got to put you under stress. And you really know how to praise God when you pay for your praise. I told the people who were here earlier that um, my praise is expensive. It's cost me an awful lot to give God praise. In these past few years, I've been through some pressure. I've been through some stress. It has cost me something to praise God. I'm, I, I'm like that woman with that alabaster box. I just come to church and pour it all on Jesus Christ. And I can't let you dictate for me how I give God praise because you don't know what my hallelujah cost me. You, you don't know what lifting my hands cost me. Now, it might not take all of that for you, but you speak for yourself. Is there anybody here? I said, is there anybody here? Been down to your last dime and the Lord stepped in right on time. You thought you'd never stop crying, but God wiped the tears from your eyes. Your praise is costing you something. And I know, I know you heard me say it before, but right here is a good place to say it again. <clears throat> praise is the rent you pay on blessings that you already enjoy. Praise is the rent you pay on blessings that you already enjoy. And some of us might be in the arrears in our rent payment. So now would be a good time to catch up your rent payment. He woke me up this morning. Hallelujah. He gave me a job tomorrow. Hallelujah. I don't have to sleep in the shelter tonight. Hallelujah. I got clothes to wear. Hallelujah. I got friends who come to see about me. Hallelujah. I got a savior who died for me. Hallelujah. And here's the shout. If he doesn't do anything else. Hey. He's already done more than enough. Listen, they were, they were suffering 
they were being persecuted for one reason. And the reason they were being persecuted is the very reason you and I will be persecuted. They were persecuted for the same reason you and I will be persecuted. They loved Jesus. And when you love Jesus, people will hate you. Jesus said, if they hated me, I wish I had a Bible reader. They're going to hate you because the servant is no greater than his master. And if the devil is not bothering you, that's a good sign that you're not bothering him. If you are on the Lord's side, you're going to be persecuted. If you would live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. False friend. People speaking evil of you when you haven't done anything to them. People lying on you for no good reason. People pulling you down just because they're jealous of how God is blessing you. That's, that's, that's suffering persecution. But now listen. Be sure you're bearing a cross and not reaping a crop. Somebody going to get that on the way home. Make sure you're suffering for the cause of Christ. And not because you sent some mess in somebody else's life. I wish I had one or two witnesses here. Make sure you're suffering for the right reason. You're suffering because you're trying to do what's right. You may not get the promotion because you go to church on Sunday morning. You, you may not be promoted. You may not be uh, lifted and elevated at the job because you go to Bible study instead of happy hour. There's some meetings that they hold behind your back because while you're at church, they're plotting and scheming and climbing the ladder of success. But make sure the ladder is not leaning against the wrong building. Because if you put your trust in God, let them meet behind your back all they want, God will promote you. Won't he do it? Fret not yourself because of evildoer. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. I know some people in this church who have trained other people for their job. And they thought they'd be pushed out. But God opened another door. Because every time God closes a door, he opens a window. He'll make a way if you're faithful to him. Come on, talk back to me here. And then there's some people in this church who didn't work for a whole year and never missed a meal, never missed a car payment, never missed a mortgage payment. David said, I've been young. I wish I had a Bible reader. And now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsake. Nor his seed. Begging for bread. God will take care of you. God will make a way for you. God will let the sun shine in your life. God will provide for you. I need somebody who's come through some pressures in your life. And your testimony is he'll show up right when you need him the most. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? My grandmother used to say, he may not come when you want him. 
but he's always right on time. That's their, their comfort. But before I leave that, before I leave their pressure and their poverty, I want you to see that provocation that was brought to them by Satan himself. It's right here in the text. He says, and I know the blasphemy, I, I know the slander of them which say they're your friend. But they're not. They belong to the synagogue of Satan. Their name is on the roll at Lily Grove. But they are members of another church. Because not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Come on, help me preach a minute. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. There are some people in here perhaps today who are at church, but they're not in church. They are of the synagogue of Satan. And look at how the devil works. Inside the church, Lucifer becomes Satan, the adversary. But outside the church, Lucifer becomes the devil, the accuser of the brethren. He's an adversary in the church and an accuser outside the church. So everywhere you go, there's the devil. Paul says, we wrestle not. I need a Bible reader here. Against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He's the adversary and the accuser. In the church, he's an adversary with false doctrine. Outside the church, he's an accuser always bringing up the past that God already forgave. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. I said he's always bringing up the past that God has already forgiven. And listen, when the devil, when the devil brings up your past that God has already forgiven, you ought to come to church and shout again. Because you can't be tried twice for the same crime. Legally, that's double jeopardy. I wish I had somebody to help me. God took care of my sins on the cross. And when you bring up what I used to be, I'm not proud of it, but it's a part of my testimony. I wish I had somebody to help me here. Somebody here used to be on drugs, but you're singing in the choir now. You used to be on alcohol, but God took that taste out of your mouth. You used to be on the streets, but God has made a difference in your life. Don't fail to make that a part of your testimony. And then here is the other side of the same coin. You might not have done any of the things I just mentioned. Not because you were so good but God kept you from it. That too is a part of your testimony. I could have been in jail. I could have been on drugs, but God kept me. That's something to shout about too. Uh. Yeah, as a hurry. The church's comfort is in verse number eight. But the church's commotion is in verse 10. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. 
The devil will cast some of you into prison that he may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Now for somebody who is confused or, or, or may, is not initiated spiritually, trouble from the devil is used by God for the Christian. There is a mystery to it, and there's a ministry for it. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. There's a mystery to it, and a ministry for it. The mystery is Satan brings it, but God allows it. I wish I had one or two more believers. Um, Second Corinthians, the chapter 12, around verse number 7. Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure. There was given to me the messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, Satan brought it, but God sent it. That's a mystery. Why does God let things like that happen in my life? It's a mystery. I was at my young 24-year-old niece's funeral this past Friday. I preached at her funeral. I, I held her in my hands, blessed her as a baby, and buried her last Friday at 24 years old with a life unfinished that's a mystery to me I don't know why God lets that happen and I wish I had an answer to give her mother and the rest of my family some things just happen because we live in a fallen world some things that happen because there is no answer trials die on every hand I wish I had somebody to help me preach and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to his blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. When all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story Somebody ought to help me preach here. Of how we've overcome, we will understand it better by and by. I said to that girl's mother, you don't have to know why. You just need to be connected to who. Because when you know who, the why can wait. Has thou not known? I need about six or seven more Bible readers. Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Father, the creator of the ends of the earth, there's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the weak and to them that have no might. He increases their strength. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. The youth shall faint and grow weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. Here's the shout. But somebody ought to help me preach it. They that wait upon the law shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They, they shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not fail. That's the mystery. But here is the ministry. The ministry is trouble comes to try what kind of faith you have. God will let you live long enough to see whether or not you believe or you shout no. 
Let me say that one more time. God will let you live long enough to see whether or not you believe or you shout no. You talking about God is good? God's going to send some pressure? And then he will see if you can still come to church. God will send death in your family and see if you still read the Bible. God will let the bottom fall out of your life and see if you still got faith in him. You know how diamonds are produced? I'm glad you asked. With the diamonds you got around your neck and the diamonds you got on your finger, you know how diamonds are produced? Diamonds are produced, brothers and sisters, with pressure, heat, and time. Pressure, heat, and time produces a diamond. You know how mature Christians are produced? Pressure, heat, and time. God will send enough pressure mixed with enough heat and let enough time passes that you'll come here on the other side of your situation and give God your loudest hallelujah. I need somebody here who's on the other side of your situation and God brought you out. It was painful while you were going through it. It hurt while you were going through it. It was unpleasant while you were going through it. But look where God brought you from. Look at how many doors God has opened for you. There's some people you thought wasn't even praying for you had your name on their mind. You are stronger now because of what you went through. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. Is there anybody here come through some recent trial and it looks like the tears would never stop falling? I got some good news for you here. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Have I got a witness here? It may look like the storm is not going to ever be over. But somebody will help me testify that the storm is passing over. It doesn't feel good right now. It doesn't look good right now. The devil seems to have the upper hand right now. But the song always reminds us that's in the book of Psalms. That song in the book of Psalms says the Lord is my light. That's a beautiful song. And my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For in the time, I said in the time, in the time, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. Is there anybody here? No God will take care of you. Is there anybody here? No God will make a way for you. If the Lord opened the door for you, help me praise his name. If the Lord been good to you and you don't care who's looking at you, if the Lord smile on you and you don't care what they say about you why don't you grab somebody not just anybody now somebody who look like they've been delivered somebody who look like they're glad to be in the service one more time somebody who look like God has made a way for them. why don't you hug somebody tell them you don't know like I know what the Lord 
has done for me. He brought me. He kept me. He raised me. He saved me. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Why don't you shake somebody's hand and preach to them like I'm preaching? Tell them you don't know the cost of my praise. You don't know why I holler so much. Let me tell you why I shout so much. Let me tell you why I holler so loud. He's been so good to me. He's been so good to me. He's opened so many doors for me. Can you tell him thank you? Thank you, Jesus. 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 I know he's all right. He will, he will dry your tears. He will be a mother for you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He'll be a husband for you. He'll be a child for you. Won't he do it? Come on, help me testify. Why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you encourage somebody? Tell them whatever you're going through, this too will pass. This too, this too, this too, I know he's all right. Why should I feel discouraged and why should the shadows come? I wish I had a witness. Why? should my heart be lonely have I got a witness here and long for my heavenly home when Jesus Jesus is my portion. 
a kind stop friend is he oh, his heart is on the sparrow and I know Hallelujah. He watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. I sing because I. Somebody ought to help me testify. Is on the sparrow. Hallelujah. And I know he watching. He watching me. To him that overcomes. He said, I will give you the crown of life. So hang in there. Don't give up. Don't stop coming to church. Don't, don't stop giving God the glory. Don't stop working in the kingdom. If you overcome, he said, I will give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And listen, he says, you will not even be hurt by the second death. Our brothers and sisters, I want to be in that number. John said, I saw a number that no man could number. They were coming from the north and the south. In the east and the west, and they had on white robe. His name was written in their forehead. And I asked the elder, John said, who are they? And the elder said, these are they who have come through tribulation. And they have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. 